start. We'll start. A 62-year-old gentleman from rural area of Pandarpur, who was a former farmer and now does his routine activities at home, presented to the medicine OPD with chief complaints of weakness of both lower limbs since 15 days, tingling and burning sensation in bilateral lower limbs since 10 days, and weakness of bilateral upper limbs since 10 days. Patient was apparently all right 15 days back when he could walk and do his daily activities. 15 days ago, he found difficulty in walking, which he told because his legs felt weak. He also reported that his chappals would slip from his leg and he would be unaware about it. Over the next two to three days, he developed buckling of knees and required support while walking. He also uh, noticed inability to get up from the starting position and had to use the support of floor while getting up. Patient also complained of tingling and burning paresthesia in both lower limbs, which was Insidious in onset, symmetrical, initially at the soles and gradually progressed up to the hips. He also complained of weakness of bilateral upper limbs at the time of developing paresthesia as he noticed difficulty in buttoning his shirt and holding object. Weakness in both upper limbs started at the same time. There is no history of any blurred vision, double vision, drooling saliva, impact hearing, difficulty swallowing or choking. There is no history of any urinary incontinence or retention, no history of swaying while walking, no history of any respiratory distress, fever or cough. There is no history of any recent vaccinations. Past history, no history of similar complaints in the past and no history of any medical disorders. Family history, no history of similar complaints in the family. Personal history, patient consumes mixed diet, appetite is normal, sleep is normal, bowel bladder habits are normal. And he didn't raise any addictions. Coming to the summary, a 62-year-old gentleman presented with distal, more than proximal, symmetrical, bilateral motor weakness in lower limbs, along with tingling and burning paresthesia, later progressing to involve upper limbs also, suggestive of most probably, uh, probably a length-dependent peripheral neuropathy. Okay, we will uh, analyze the symptoms, no? Yes, ma'am. One by one. You told that he was well preserved till 15 days before he came to the hospital and noticed weakness of both legs. No? Yes, ma'am. So the weakness was evidenced by chapel slipping and buckling. Buckling of knees and chapel. <laughs> and getting up from sitting posture was weak. So, motor was first or sensory was first? Motor was first. Motor. So, then we will analyze that motor part. Eh? So, oh, oh, chapel slipping, you said, no? That you said it is with knowledge or without knowledge? Uh, without knowledge. Without knowledge. Like, so uh, he has problem <laughs> holding the chapels and he would be unaware, like the chapels would slip and he was unaware about the slipping. He couldn't feel so, that the chapels are not In that there. case, probably it is sensory that pattern. So, if the chapels are uh, slipping, I always teach your uh, undergraduate students, no? So when you have uh, your relationship with a chapel, you analyze it in several steps. One, are you able to put your feet into the chapel? Second, are you able to hold it on? <coughs> then are you able to walk forward? Then are you able to remove your feet from the chapel? These are the four things we will ask because this person has got both motor and sensory. <coughs> so which started the illness, we don't know. So we, it may be useful in some situations for diagnosis. Pure motor neuropathies are there, pure nerve sensory are there. So uh, motor onset and late sensory. So all this will be useful. So if a person is having difficulty in putting the feet into the chapel, which is difficult only if he is not looking at the feet. If, if he is looking at the feet, he can put the feet into the chapel well. He can hold down and walk if he is looking at the feet. And he can walk also with the head fixed on the feet. And he can yes. remove the feet comfortably. That is sensory. Sensory. So everything is okay if he is using his vision. Because for your proprioceptive impulse, we have got sensory afferents and we have got vision. So if the vision is utilized, the proprioceptive loss will be fully compensated. 
then it means it is only purely sensory. Thanks. So we will tell, describe, we will tell, describe as a small girl uh, or small boys, whatever it is. You will say patient can put the feet into the chapel when he is looking at the feet. When he is not looking at the feet, he is searching. Hmm. And he can approximate the feet properly and hold, provided his gaze is fixed on the feet. And similarly, he can remove the chapel and he doesn't lose the chapel unless he remove his gaze. But if he removes his gaze, he walks forward and the chapels are behind. So that is classically sensory. Suppose then motor, it can be LMN or EMN. So if it is uh, LMN motor, what will happen? LMN motor, which helps to grip the chapel, is the interoshe muscles, the small muscles. So putting the feet into the chapel is easy only because the gap is more. So the gap is more, you can easily put the feet, uh, chapel, feet into the chapel and you don't have to fix your gaze on the feet. You can just put, but you cannot bring them together. So patient is able to put the feet into the chapel very easily, even without fixing his gaze, but he cannot hold on and walk. And he can remove the feet easily, uh, even without looking at the feet. So only the second component is difficult. That is holding on and walking is difficult. And chapel slips with knowledge. That is pure element. That's the Indrashi army. So only the second component, holding on and walking, okay. is weak if the pure element is there. Suppose it is Uyaman. In Uyaman, we always tell that it is not muscle paralysis. It is movement paralysis. In Yellaman, it is muscle paralysis. Whether at the level of the muscle or nerve or root or whatever it is, what gets ultimately paralyzed is the muscle. Whereas in Uyaman, muscle doesn't get paralyzed. What gets paralyzed is the movement, the schema of the movement. The schema of the movement has got a music. Kinetic melody. Oh, so that is called a kinetic melody. Because agonist should act, antagonist should relax, synergist and uh, synergist should support. So synergist and fixator. We say agonist, antagonist, synergist, fixator. So agonist should be promoted, antagonist should be inhibited, synergist and fixator should be assisting the uh, act, whatever the person is doing. So if uh, there is an EMN, movement paralysis is there, no muscle paralysis, and it is the music of the movement that is lost. So music of the movement is needed for putting your feet into the chapel, holding on and walking, and removing the chapel. Mm -hmm. So if all three faces are affected, that is upper motor. Mm -hmm. When you are trying to put the fingers, someone will override, someone will deviate. No? And when you want to hold on and walk again, some, some uh, agonist will contract along with the antagonist. So it becomes very erratic and clumsy. And when you want to remove also the antagonist comes and acts. So again, you become clumsy and you need the help of your hand. So these are the three things clearly. Even though you may know it, it is better to do that exercise as small girls and boys. So it becomes easy for you. No? Then yes. you have got other situations where the chapel will sleep. You may have a dystonia. That will be self-evident. Uh, you see, when you put your feet, the feet twist. So that will be, so it is chappi, uh, sleeping um, because of the twisting. So in addition to the problems in putting, holding, and removing, all aspects will be affected in dystonia. The patient will tell that he is twisting. His feet is twisting. That means he has developed a dystonia. So these are the situations. So in your patient, you told the chapel slipped without his knowledge. Other two components are understood. It was not uh, uh, told, but better to tell. You repeatedly tell. At some situation, you will be more you precise in your diagnosis. So this looks like probably a sensory. And among sensory, which fibers become uh, uh, involved in holding on the chapel. You have got a small myelinated fiber, you have got unmyelinated fiber, and you have got large myelinated fibers. 
you see large myelinated fibers are proper among sensory large myelinated fibers are proprioceptive fibers which go through the posterior column the small myelinated fibers are some of them a delta that is sensory autonomic and uh, temperature whereas the unmyelinated is the c fiber that is pain mm. so you have got all these group of fibers so which is the culprit so now you know it is probably my patient's disease started with the sensory and did it start with the small sensory or the large sensory is the next question so what probably uh, would have affected is the proprioceptive fiber because proprioceptive fiber is the one which helps you to define your relationship with the chapel the foot relationship with the chapel or foot relationship with the environment all this is by the proprioceptive okay. fiber so it is probably the myelinated fiber so are getting a clue my patient started with sensory and the sensory was myelinated fiber probably because he did not say that he could not appreciate temperature he had altered sweating or he did not appreciate pain he only slipped his chapel so it is a proprioceptive fiber and the proprioceptive fibers are the large myelinated fibers so that is the uh, beginning of the disease first second and now that after that uh, patient started buckling i think is the second symptom or tingling is the second symptom oh uh, ma'am buckling buckling so buckling again i um, i always tell for small girls no so you should learn uh, in that systematic way which you keep on repeating no so buckling we always tell Uh, describe as painful buckling he is a old person farmer no doing hard work what about his joints we don't know so when there is a buckling we always ask is it painful buckling or painless buckling it was painless ma'am hmm. so painful buckling is more common it is due to injury to the cruciate ligament in you know cartilages chronic osteoarthritis and destructive joints on uh, so whether it is a painful buckling so one word will be in a it puts us in a track no so it's a painless buckling so my patient had a painless buckling can any joint disease produce painless buckling you have got the conditions like tabis dorsalis hmm. chalk coat joint we call it as chalk coat joint it's a painless joint completely disorganized there the patient buckles due to the disorganized joint only there is no motor weakness but that is a painless buckling most of the joint buckles are painful whereas tabis dorsalis or there is something called pseudo tabis pseudo tabis is diabetes diabetes behaves like tabis dorsalis so there also there is a painless buckling but it is due to joint so generally joints are painful and sometimes painless buckling can happen with the joint disease that is chakot joint or pseudo tabis of diabetes so that is one group next it is a painless buckling you know then you ask whether it is a stiff buckling or a flail buckling stiff buckling means it is upper motor neuron flail buckling means it is lower motor neuron so what is stiff black why stiff buckling happens in upper motor neuron like what we said in the leg there is both human and uh, kinetic muscle so both egon is antagonist synergis fixator will contract together and relax together so when they contract together the leg becomes like a log of wood very stiff mm-hmm. when it relaxes patient will fall so this happens in compressive myelopathies so the patient is craniotrophic junction disorders and other causes of compressive myelopathies also they buckle and that buckle is stiff buckling again due to loss of kinetic melody and disorganized contraction and disorganized relaxes then you can ask whether the buckle happened with the transient loss of awareness suppose thing you have got a hydrocephalus so all this we may be thinking okay my patient is having a uh, stiff buckling so it is spinal cord and you keep on investigating spinal cord he may have a third ventricular tumor 
you see that is called hydrocephalic buckling you might have studied in your anatomy with the homunculus how is the man represented in the brain you know that the leg fibers are in the inner hemispheric region in between the two hemisphere in the inner hemispheric region the leg is there whereas the trunk the upper limb head and lip are on the superior lateral surface so in the inner hemispheric region both legs are there supposing you have a pedunculated tumor usually we call it as colloid cyst of the third ventricle they are pedunculated tumors they move freely in the early stage intermittently they produce blockage of the aqueduct when the aqueduct is blocked there is a quick dilatation of the ventricle so what will happen in the adult brain the when the brain cannot expand out because the skull bone is fused so it can is Uh, expand where space is there, so it will compress between both sides. So the leg area is there, and patient will buckle. Here there is a sudden rise in the intra intracranial pressure, so he will have brief loss of consciousness. They may have a bout of small incontinence, but immediately they get up. So in that, if such a history is there, unless you ask, they may not tell. They may mm -hmm. feel bad. I fell down and I passed urine. Why I will tell it to the doctor? so they may not tell it so you have to ask it in that case you will not investigate the spinal cord but you will investigate the brain that is called the hydrocephalic buckling okay ma'am then you go to elemen buckling and we have got other conditions we call it as drop attacks cataplexy you see you i don't know whether uh, undergraduate students uh, should know uh, or you feel confused in that case you tell me i am telling cataplexy you might have heard of cataplexy no yes ma'am after that uh, after a heavy meal and a carbohydrate meal they are exerting getting into the cycle suddenly they fall they may really not understand what you are asking as buckling you see buckling we mean that the patient lands on the knee but uh, these cataplexy people fall like a bag of bones they just collapse like a bag of bones but if you ask are you buckling on your knee they will say yes they have retained consciousness mm -hmm. they fall like a bag of bone usually it happens with heavy carbohydrate meal and exertion and they may have narcolepsy and hypnagogic hallucinations what is narcolepsy means in an active discussion you sleep off or when you are doing an active cycling driving swimming you sleep off that also they may have a social stigma i sleep in the class who will tell no teacher would have woken up many times and he may think it is uh, his laziness or something like that so you may not tell it so you let ask in a odd situation are you sleeping off and in sleep they get hallucination get paral paralyzed and get frightened and somebody comes and touches them they wake up so that they also they may not tell they will tell they might think that they had a bad dream and they froze in the sleep so that is hypnagogic hallucination and sleep paralysis in the sleep they may look frozen unable to move but somebody touches immediately they will be all, all right it is a sleep architecture change rem intrusion in the nrem so the atonia of rem becomes manifest in nrem so they become paralyzed so but they will attribute it to dreams or fear and all this carry stigma they may not tell that so you ask all this then the treatment is totally different i have seen patients where these cataplexies have been missed totally somebody treat it as epilepsy and many many labels are given psychogenic all these things are there so you have to ask proper history then you will know cut out then you have got something called drop attack no this is seen in idiopathic drop attack in elderly and uh, that is sudden falls in elderly these things are there what is drop attack is sudden loss of postural tone with immediate writing and retained consciousness so these people are conscious they suddenly fall and they get up and it is supposed to be due to cross cerebral ischemia in the elderly you have got the basilar artery and its branches from there top of the basilar branches are coming and these branches are supplying the cross cerebrum so small it is called top of the basilar syndrome or kaplan syndrome 
After repeated attacks, patient may go into full-fledged vertebrobasal or stroke. But initially, it may be drop attack. And there is also an idiopathic drop attack where you do not know the cause. So it's a sudden loss of pastoral tone with immediate writing and retained consciousness. Commonly seen in elderly, one cause is cerebral ischemia, another cause is idiopathy. Then you have got other non-system causes like a stroke atom attacks. Patient may be falling due to stroke atom attack and he may have a diabetic neuropathy. No? Mm -hmm. It totally miss the stroke atom attack means patient will uh, die. No? So how to get a history for a stroke atom attack? Sudden pallor, there's a yes history. I'm sure everybody feels fascinated uh, studying cardiology, you see. So patient becomes pale because there's a brief yes history. So, pallor to flushing. So, during the attack of fall, did anybody notice that he became blanched like paper? And then he flushed. Because immediately the rhythm returns, so they flush. So, pallor to flushing is a typical feature of stroke atom attacks. Of course, you have to examine and find out what about the ECG and the pulse rate and other things. So, history wise, pallor to flushing. Then you have got conditions like the uh, organ of sugar candle. This is chromaffin tissue tumors. So suppose you've got a jugular body syndrome. There is the episodic release of biogenic amines. They also fall like that. How do they fall? They flush and fall. Unlike stroke attacks, stroke atom attacks, they become pale and fall. These, uh, these patients, because of the release of the biogenic amines, they have palpitation, they sweat, they flush, then they fall. Then you look for a jugular body tumor or organ of sugar candle, we call it in the bifurcation of the iota, or it may be in the suprarenal itself. So then the uh, approach goes in nearly different. All these patients will tell I am buckling. No? In this context, it is different. It's a continuum, but just general, I am telling you how to approach. My patient can have one more pathology also, we don't know, so we should not mix, miss it. So all these are. Huh? Uh, falling attacks in patients and uh, systemic causes we are thinking. Then you think element. Then you come to element buckling. So what is element buckling? The muscle that stabilizes the thigh on the knee. That is quadriceps. quadriceps. So if the quadriceps muscle or its nerve supply or its root supply is affected. So nerve is femoral nerve. Root is L3 root. Mm -hmm. And it is coming from the lumbosacral plexus. So you may have a diabetic lumbosacral plexopathy or diabetic amyotrophy. So any situation. So it is either quadriceps weakness or is it uh, femoral nerve or L3 root. L3. So now what we are finding, this patient started with the proprioception, but motor is proximal. That's a very important point. You see? You told length dependent neuropathy. That is mm -hmm. not, it's not length dependent. Now, do you understand? Yes. Mm -hmm. small, you are a small girl only, no problem. You see, my teacher, we used to have K.V. Thirvengadam. He's a very famous physician from Madras Medical College. So, he used to tell us that sometimes an uh, undergraduate student can mistake a Gillian Barrier's hemiplegia. Okay, there is a facial palsy, there is a paralysis. So you can call it a semi-plegia, no problem. Go through the systematic approach, then you will know what it is. So it is not length dependent clearly from your own history. Yes, ma'am. You understand? Yes, So sensory is distal, motor is proximal. Proximal. It's a very, very important point for us to diagnose. So patient's motor paralysis started proximally. Either it is at the quadriceps or L3 root or femoral nerve or lumbosacral plexus that we will get close after exam. So that is the second point we are getting in this patient. And then the patient had difficulty in getting up from sitting posture. So the motor is progressing proximal words, not progressing distal words. If it is progressing distal words, patient would have developed foot drop. Hmm. So after the slippage of supple without sensation, patient buckled, that is proximal motor, and then he develops difficulty in getting up from sitting. That means the motor is still more proximal. 
So clearly not length dependent. You understand why systematically we approach the diagnosis becomes very uh, eye opening. Understand? Yes, ma'am. So what is that difficulty in getting up? You always tell patient yes. has to when you are getting up from the floor, you have to draw your legs under the thigh, put your hands on either side, and get up n block with the pelvis down. That is the way we get up. So we can ask what is the problem. Is the patient sitting in the floor or getting up from the chair? And if he's sitting in the floor and getting up, if it is element, they can easily flux their legs and bring it under their thighs. If it is human, they cannot. So if it is a paraplegia of upper motor or quadriplegia of upper motor nature, patient will have a stiff leg. So he cannot flux it. Somebody's help will be needed. So if he's able to flux it, even if it is paralyzed, it means it's a fly leg. So fly leg is a element, stiff leg is a UM. So if it is from the floor, you ask whether he has to take somebody's help to flex his leg and bring it folded. Then when he puts his hand on the sides, what is happening? If he able to get up with the pelvis down or he gets up with the pelvis up. Human persons, they get up with the pelvis up only, pelvis down only. There is no problem. But it is element patients, because they are having hip extensoris, gluteus maximus. So gluteus maximus is weak. Then only you have difficulty in getting up from the floor, element level. So in that case, what is happening is the erector spinae muscle, which is having its origin from the iliac crust. So it will come to help. Okay, I will help you to get up. So what does the erector spine do? Erector spine erects the spine. So it will uh, switch off its activity for some time. If it can, if it is wanting to erect the spine, it cannot pull the hip. Supposing you want to go home, you cannot present the case. It is like that. In two places, you cannot be there. So if the erector spine wants to erect the spine, it cannot work on the attachment in the iliac crest, where it is not the primary uh, function. Its primary function is erecting the spine. It's only a synergist in hip extension. So it will switch off his spine erection. So the patient will bend forward and he will pull the hip up. So in an element paralysis, the hip will go up. Normal and human, the hip remains down. While getting up, the patient is stiff. He cannot pull his leg under the thigh. He needs to be assisted to get up, but his semiology doesn't change. The pelvis is down only. But in Yellama, the pelvis goes up and the spine erection is lost. So what will happen? Pelvis goes up and patient bends down. That is called hip up sign. It's called hip up sign. So hip up sign, if it is present, it is definitely Yellama. Patient may be able to tell, may not be able to tell. They won't know. You see, then after that, when the now he, uh, you can stabilize yourself on your joints itself. So patient will try to stabilize one joint by putting his uh, hand on one leg and stabilize that joint and put one hand on the floor. That is called a tripod sign. So you are standing on two legs and one hand. That is a tripod. After that, he has stabilized one knee with one hand. Then he takes the opposite hand and puts it on the opposite thigh and slowly climbs. That's a classical Gover sign. Gover sign, you describe it in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But any situation where the hip extensor is affected, you get the Gover's way of getting up. So if that semiology was there, it is gluteus maximus. So now, so that's so why you are getting up difficulty. Exactly, uh, we do not know. We, many patients cannot describe their semiology. So if they describe and they are educated enough to observe and they tell, well, if they are not able to tell, it's okay. So now we found in our patient distal sensory proximal motor. <coughs> then he developed tingling and numbness and burning. You told three things, no? Three sensory phenomena. <coughs> so sensory 
we call irritative features and paralytic features every every thing even motor also it is there so irritative features are positive signs tingling burning uh, feeling of cold mm -hmm. they are all positive numbness is negative so your patient is having a combination of positive mm -hmm. and negative sensory symptoms that indicates probably some of the fibers are uh, very severely damaged and some of the fibers are still alive. Positive symptoms, we call it as the cry of the dying nerve. Mm -hmm. So when the nerve is not dead and it is dying, it cries. So it's called cry of the dying nerve. So how are you going to explain all this? So tingling sensation. <clears throat> Normally, uh, large sensory fibers. We already found that the proprioceptive or the large myelinated fiber is involved. Mm -hmm. And large myelinated fiber always inhibits the mm -hmm. small myelinated fiber. Why it is happening? We know that we have got a large skin, large surface area, and so many environmental stimuli. All that we need not attend to. So we always tell, we always imagine that brain is in the process of gathering maximum data. No. What brain does is triage. <coughs> It filters off unwanted data. It takes only the wanted data so that you have focused attention on what you should attend to. So what brain does is triaging. When triaging fails, can you tell the syndrome? When triaging fails, when the brain is ineffective, it doesn't triage, you get ADHD. Attention deficit, hyperactivity. Now, because you are not triaging, you are trying to attend to everything in your environment, you are not focusing on anything and you are restless. So brain does not try to gather maximum information. Instead, it tries to filter off information. That is why the large myelinated fibers are inhibiting the small myelinated fiber. So when the large myelinated fiber is diseased, partially, its inhibition on the small fiber is improper. So that produces tingling. So you call it as an unmodulated small fiber disease, a small fiber function, either due to destructive disease of the large fiber or irritative disease of the small fiber. So that is tingling. So it indicates partial damage to the large fibers. Then you are having a burning sensation. So burning sensation is a Positive symptom coming from the small fibers, temperature fiber. Pain and temperature and autonomic or small fibers. Pain is the smallest and others are in that order of myelination. So you are having some irritative symptom from the small fiber. So, so far we found that distal large myelinated sensory, proximal large myelinated motor. Motor, motor fibers are large myelinated fibers. You know that proprioceptive fiber and motor fibers having the maximum myelination. So the proximal fibers are large myelinated. Now you are getting one symptom from a small myelinated. It is irritative symptom. So after, during the course of the disease, you started with a large myelinated sensory motor fibers in a non-length dependent pattern. It is not respecting the length dependent pattern, non length dependent pattern. And now it is picking up the small sensory fibers as the disease is progressing. And there is also some destruction that also indicates the disease has progressed, numbness. So, numbness and the burning indicate that the disease is progressing. Some of the large fibers are getting destroyed, and some of the small fibers are also getting involved as the disease is advanced. That's the information. So at this point, I'm sure you know, but still we can use said paresthesia. So we will try to define because you are undergraduate students, paresthesia, dysesthesia, hyperalgesia, hyperpadia, these terms are there. So would you like to uh, define? Yes, yes, ma'am. Ma paresthesia is a sensory perception in absence of a sensory stimuli, uh, which is due to uh, defective modulation. 
Yes. Dysesthesia is altered perception of a sensory stimuli, which is uh, due to neuronal crosstalk. Wonderful. Then hyperesthesia is lowered threshold for sensory stimuli. Very good. And hyperpathia is uh, increased threshold for low threshold with an exaggerated response. Excellent. Excellent answer. So you are having a paresthesia mostly. So paresthesia indicates unmodulation. That again indicates that there is a disproportionate involvement of the large fiber and the small fiber. So large fiber modulation on the small fiber is ineffective or partially effective. There is no dysesthesia. Dysesthesia indicates repair has started. So there is no dysesthesia. So it's a progressive disease repair mechanism. So not yet started. So it's a modulatory failure. Very clear in the sensory. Then you said that the sensory symptoms involve the upper limbs. So that is uh, for uh, the last 10 days. Ma'am, uh, I meant that there was motor weakness in the upper limb while uh, paresthesia of lower limb was started at that okay. time. So what is the motor symptom in the upper limb? Uh, weakness of upper limb, like he had difficulty in buttoning his shirt and holding objects. Okay. Buttoning his shirt is done by what muscle? Uh, lumbrical opponents. 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 Yes. Mixing the food is lumbrical. Buttoning is opposition. So it is opponents. Holding objects is long flexors. Exerts. So probably uh, the symptomatic part in the upper limb is the distal motor. Uh, did you have any sensory symptoms in the upper limb? No. No. Could he elevate his hand and comb his hair? Uh, no, ma'am. Oh. He's unable to. Yes. Uh, is it because he cannot hold the comb or he cannot lift the hand? He cannot lift the hand above the head. So, proximal is also involved. Yes, in ma'am. In so, in the upper limb, distal and proximal almost simultaneously. Yes, ma'am. No, apparently. from Or did it evolve distal first and proximal uh, uh, later or together? It got involved. Is he able to tell that? It's too oh, short. No, ma'am, he couldn't. Not sure. Okay. So, uh, did you have any sensory symptoms in the upper limb? No, ma'am. No. So, it is third part we are getting is upper limb, distal and proximal motor. Okay. So, now you said he has a quadriplegia and we want to know uh, whether it is. So, uh, summarizing the uh, history one is the distal large myelinated sensory and proximal large myelinated motor in the lower limb and distal and proximal motor in the upper limb, upper limb. and uh, towards the end there is some small myelinated fiber involvement in the lower limb. lower limb at present there is no features of repair mechanism starting there is no dysesthesia in lower limb so now we want to know whether it is LMN or UMN. No? For, for our undergraduate students, that is the question. So quadriplegia can be UMN, LMN. So would you like to differentiate? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, ma'am, UMN, there will be spasticity and there will be hyperreflexia. Fasciculations hmm. will be absent. And generally, uh, like the entire limb is involved. Whereas in LMN, there will be flaccidity. Uh, reflexes will be absent, fasciculations will be present, and a particular group of muscles will be involved. So upper motor neuron, as you said, it is stiff. And lower motor neuron is flying. Two, upper motor neuron, even if the duration is long, wasting is less common. Whereas lower motor neuron, wasting is common. Third, upper motor neuron, as you said, fasciculations are uh, less common unless it is part of a condition like motor neuron disease. Whereas in LMN, fasciculations, myokinias, cramps, contractures come early. Then when you examine, if it is upper motor neuron, the pattern of uh, motor is uh, having a cord pattern. Whereas in lower motor neuron, it is nerve or root or muscle pattern. Then if you check the reflexes, the superficial reflexes are lost and deep reflexes are exaggerated in upper motor neuron. Whereas in lower motor neuron, both are lost. 
both superficial and deep reflexes are lost. And you, are, you can have upgoing plunder in upper motor neuron that is not seen in lower motor neuron. Then you can have bladder bubble, partial or complete involvement in upper motor neuron depending on the completeness of the pathology. In LMN, unless it is a cardiac syndrome, you do not get a bladder bowel involvement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then you can say that um, uh, you can have a uh, voluntary reflex dissociation in upper motor neuron. For example, the reflex movements are exaggerated. So we tell that even a hemiplegic patient, when he is yawning, the so-called paralyzed limb will move. It is called fandiculation. Because it is only the movements that are paralyzed. Muscle is not paralyzed. So by some reflex phenomena, the, you, like you are checking the deep tendon reflex, the, it is moving. If it is LMN, it will not move. Because mm -hmm. muscle is paralyzed, it will not move. But UMN, when you do the deep tendon reflex, the limb moves. Similarly, when you yawn or cough, or when you have a severe panic situation, even though it will be very clumsy because of the lack of kinetic melody, you can move. So that is human, that you call it as voluntary reflex uh, dissociation in motor activities present in upper motor neuron. In lower motor neuron, neither voluntary is possible nor reflex is possible. So these are the points which will help you to differentiate. In our patient, we are not finding a, a bladder bubble. We are not finding a stiffness. We feel that the patient is flying and it is showing a peculiar pattern. It is not showing kinetic melody loss. It is not showing a trunk level of sensory loss. Instead, mm -hmm. it is a uh, distal more than proximal sensory and proximal more than distal motor mm -hmm. and distal and proximal motor in the upper limb, which is not at all the feature in upper mm -hmm. motor. In upper motor neuron, it is the fine movements. Proximal movement will not be involved. It is the fine movements. Supposing it's a partial pyramidal syndrome, you may not be able to type. You may not be able to put your feet into the chapel, whereas you may be still walk. It's the fine movements which are lost most. It is not the proximal movements. So in this patient, neither the motor nor the sensory is favoring a UMN. It is all favoring an LMN. Mm -hmm. So at the end of your history, you will tell, my patient has got a sensory which is more predominantly large myelinated fiber and moderate small myelinated fiber and which is more involved in the lower limb than the upper limb. Second, you have got a motor which is proximal more than distal and proximal and distal together in the upper limb and looks like an element syndrome. That's all. So what situations you get proximal motor when there is a, what is common between proprioceptive and motor fiber is myelin, myelin. So some disease which is primarily affecting the myelin, myelin you see. So if it is a myelin picking up disease, wherever myelin is more, it will affect. You see in the motor fibers, the short roots are more myelin, in the long roots are less myelin. So that is why it is proximal. It's a radiculo neuropathy. Proximal motor and distal sensory. So in the motor fibers, the myelin content is more in the proximal roots. So the proximal one, proximal motor and distal sensory is very typical of demyelinating diseases. So you can say my patient has got a sensory motor, non-length dependent, proximal motor, distal sensory. Uh, rapidly progressive element syndrome, which is, you said it is axonopathy. Clinically, it's very difficult to call it as axonopathy. Mm -hmm. no? uh, it is demolition. So you call it as axonopathy when that we need not tell because it is a pathological diagnosis. Mm -hmm. From the history, there is no need to tell it at all. But you told it is an axonopathy. So I want to tell axon is not the myelin. Axon is the direct projection from the nerve cell body. So axons get affected in disease of the cell body. Axoplasmic flow. So there is a flow of axoplasm which comes from the cell body. 
So when there is a cell body disease, the axon gets affected. So where will be the axoplasmic flow? Very less. It will be distal most. Because when you pump from the cell body, the part of the axon which is closer to the cell body will get more. As you move farther and farther and farther, it becomes less. So that is called a dying back neuropathy. So axonopathies are dying back. They die from far away. So motor and sensory will be distal. It will be distal. And second, the, yeah, there will be yearly fasciculations, but distal. And motor weakness proximal may be very less prominent. And of course, there are electrophysiological parameters. Normal, apparently normal conduction with reduced amplitude and yearly fibrillation that you need not know. Because remember, when you call clinically axonopathy, it is axoplasmic flow that gets damaged. So it is all distal. So angle jerk may be absent, other reflexes may be present. Mm -hmm. Early fasciculation, early wasting. And when you do electrophysiology, nerve conduction is relatively good. Paradoxically, conduction is good, but amplitude is reduced, indicating that axons are lost. So that is axonopathy. In this situation, it is neither length dependent nor axonopathy clinically. Yes, it looks yes. like a rapidly progressive radicular neuropathy mm -hmm. of element nature. And first cause, uh, and it picking up the uh, myelinated fibers. So it is looking like an acute demyelinating radicular neuropathy, among which you have got several conditions, the commonest being Guillain Barre syndrome. So it looks like that. You have got uh, other conditions like. Uh, uh, glucose toxic neuropathy. You see, if this patient is a very severe diabetic and he took a lot of poison and his sugar became very high, 600, 700, he's already having a background sensory neuropathy. He develops a motor neuropathy. If you mistake, Hello. Then you have got conditions like porphyria. Or not audible. Am I audible? Uh, no, you are audible, ma'am. Okay. So another condition, always remember porphyria. Then conditions like tyrosinemia. So sometimes they are all metabolic disorders. They become symptomatic a little more rarely, but they can be acute. So acute presentation of neuropathies is seen in porphyria, tyrosinemia, Rufsum's disease when the phytonic acid accumulate due to dietary uh, composition, glucose toxic neuropathy, they are all rapid neuropathies of metabolic nature, but applicable to children. And only glucose toxic neuropathy is applicable to uh, senior persons. And you have got uh, tick paralysis, you have got uh, black widow spider bite, and you have got some kind of snake bites. All these can present a syndrome which resembles a rapidly progressive radical neuropathy you have to take the context and make the diagnosis. So this person has got probably a radicular neuropathy of guillain barre in nature. I cannot call it as non-length uh, dependent and I cannot call it as mm -hmm. axonopathy at this point of time. So go on and examine. So what is unusual in this patient, he is not having any cranial nerve palsy mm -hmm. that can be uh, there usually. And what are all the, so in case, it looks like an ADP. So what are all the good prognostic features and bad prognostic features? Uh, bad prognostic features is extremes of age. Yes. Uh, then this, uh, this still, uh, sorry, descending paralysis and wasting yes. uh, of muscles. Autonomic involvement. Autonomic involvement. Descending pattern, extremes of age, autonomic involvement, associated uh, hypomatinia. And preceding symptom is uh, GIT and not respiratory. So supposing pre preceding is that uh, patient has got H. pylori. Mm. Then the prognosis is not that good. And rapidity of progression. Within two, three days, he completely paralyzed. And so these are the bad prognostic features. In our patient, I think he has a age, not that extreme, but he's senior person. And fairly rapid. 
not that rapid, fairly rapid, but it is ascending pattern, no respiratory involvement, no bulbar involvement. All these are good points for him. So like that, we will keep probably it is a, and you have got perineum plastic, HIV associated radicular neuropathies. All those things we will keep in our mind for these conditions. Okay. And then on examination. A uh, patient is conscious, cooperative and well-oriented to time place person and was examined with view co uh, consent. Mm -hmm. Vitals pulse was 84 beats per minute, regular in rhythm, volume normal and uh, no radio radial radio femoral delay. BP was 120 by 70 uh, millimeters of mercury. Mm -hmm. uh, respiratory rate was 18 cycles per minute. With what no is the relevance of blood pressure in this case? Um, Not for a small girl like you still. Because you are answering very well. Ma'am, I... because if autonomic uh, component is there, maybe postural hypertension can be seen. Yes, they can have postural hypertension. Agreed. Then in that case, you will be very, very cautious. And there is a you know, you, sudden death is common. Say if he has postural hypertension or supine hypertension, he can die suddenly. So that is one warning. And if you find hypertension, in males, there is a condition, polyarthritis nodosa, vasculitis. Mm -hmm. It can occur in young and old also. HBS age associated polyarthritis nodosa can come a little later. So hypertension is a clue. You record and you find very high blood pressure if the patient is not aware. You will have to look for vasculitis. So that is one. And of course, porphyria can produce uh, fluctuating blood pressure but not in this age group, we should have manifest early. Okay. So as you said, hypotension indicating autonomic involvement, hypertension indicating a vasculitic etiology and fluctuating hypertension in metabolic disorders. Okay. Head to toe examination showed no color, rectus, cyanosis, clubbing or lymphadenopathy. Hmm. Uh, patient uh, showed no signs of nutritional deficiency or no neurocutaneous markers. Mm -hmm. A nervous system, higher mental functions were normal with MMSC score of 30. He was right-handed individual, conscious, cooperative, oriented to time and time, place and person, appearance and behavior was appropriate, emotionally stable, recent immediate and remote memory was intact and speech is normal. Uh, Ma'am, cranial nerves, no involvement. All mm -hmm. examination was normal. Motor system, uh, attitude, uh, the lower limbs were externally rotated and no atrophy was noted. Mm. Tone uh, in the upper limb, flexor extensor was normal. Lower limb tone was uh, reduced. Hypotonia was seen. Power uh, at shoulder joint, elbow joint, wrist joint, it was grade 4 power. While that hip was also grade 4, knee, ankle and toe, it was three. So power is reduced in both upper as well as lower limbs. Reflexes, superficial reflexes, plantar was uh, no response. Supinator, knee and ankle jerk were lost. Uh, sensory, uh, reduced sensations in all uh, both uh, uh, lower limbs. Cerebellar examination, no signs of cerebellar dysfunction. However, gait couldn't be examined. Other systems... S CVS, S1, S2, her, no murmurs. Uh, normal, uh, RS examination, normal vesicular breath sounds were heard over both lung fields. DI saw non-tender abdomen, no palpable organomegaly. So at this point of time, uh, for the sake of uh, small undergraduate students, so would you like to define tone? Uh, tone is the partial state of contraction at the resting state. Very good. So, when you, how do you demonstrate hypotonia in the upper limbs and hypotonia in the lower limbs? Uh, so, ma'am, when we, are, uh, we need to examine the muscle at rest, so when we are uh, extending the uh, limb, we will feel for biceps and when we are flexing, we will feel for triceps. Hmm. And uh, if the, um, like, the muscle appears stiff, we will call it hypertonia. So you, know, you can do the passive examination and find out how much resistance the patient is offering. 
So the resistance offered normally is a subjective thing which you learn by repeatedly doing and you feel that the resistance is less. So that is during passive movement, you find resistance is less and you can palpate the muscles and you find them flabbing. And then you can do uh, passive shaking. When you shake normally, a uh, normal person also will resist and an upper, upper motor neuron will not be shakeable. Whereas LM1 can be easily shaken several times. So when you shake, it will move this side and that side in a floppy way. Then you keep the person like this. Tell the patient to keep like this. Normally, you have right angle. Spastic, it will be obtuse. Whereas flaccid, it will be acute. So flaccid limb will go into acute angle. So these are the various methods in the upper limb. In the lower limb, again, we passively uh, pull at the knee or you can shake the feet and uh, palpate the muscles. Then uh, in children, there are other methods. In adults, you pull at the knee and shake the legs. That is how you do. And my subtle hypertonia, if it is there, it is in adductors. So you'll do always before you commit, you look at the adductors. The adductor tone is normal. The tone may be increase. Uh, so otherwise, passimum. So that is how you demonstrate hypotonia. How will you grade the powers? Uh, grade 0 power is no movement. Grade 1 is flickering. Grade 2 is uh, while eliminating gravity. Grade 3 against gravity. Grade 4 with moderate resistance. And grade 5 with resistance. Very good. How are you going to eliminate gravity? Uh, we will ask the patient to uh, line the lateral position. One. By changing the position so that gravity does not act on that muscle which you are testing. That is one method. Second method, you can do it with a sling. You support that limb with a sling. Then the sling opposes the gravity. So gravity becomes eliminated. Second, you can, third is you can do the movement underwater. Water. That is the underwater, there is gravity elimination. That is the basis of hydrotherapy. So even if you have a less power, you put the baby or adult or whomever in the floater in the water, they can move their limbs themselves. Even with grade two power, they may be able to move because gravity becomes eliminated. So that is how you eliminate gravity. So after examination, what additional findings we got is at, at the end of the progression, the distal muscles are also involved. As the disease progress, distal muscles of the lower limbs have also been involved. And, uh, it is probably more involved than the proximal at the end of the exam. So this, uh, that may be the reason you thought it is length dependent, but the way it evolved is a proximal motor from the way you presented the history. So toward the end, distal has become involved. So what you would like to call this condition as? The way it evolved. Now you know the whole story, no? So yes. the distal motor sensory is nerve, length dependent, whereas proximal motor is radical. So this is called radiculoneuropathy. Neuropathy. Why the distal became uh, weak in both legs? Because it's a nerve part. And proximal is radicular part. So proximal is based on the myelin content. So this is a radiculoneuropathy. The yes, neuropathy yes. is distal symmetrical mixer and radiculopathy is proximal motor. Mm -hmm. So it's a radiculoneuropathy. And... Uh, Unless you have found that wasting has set in distally and you find twitching distally and you find angle jerk is absent and other reflexes of preserved, clinically you cannot call it as an axon. Exactly. Axon gets involved once the myelin goes. You see, like the insulation goes, the wire also goes. Mm. But is it really a pure axonopathy? Because it is uh, of prognostic relevance. If it is an axonopathy, and the patient's yeah, chance of recovery becomes very less. And it is more common axon of peer axon of these are toxins, drugs, like that. And uh, otherwise, it is a mixed picture. So now you will have to do the. So his reflexes are absent is proximally also, no? Yes, ma'am. So it is uh, difficult to say that it is a peer axon of the. It's a demyelination with secondary axon involvement. Fairly quickly. So now you can do, do the electrophysiology done. Huh? Nerve conductions are done. 
Yes, ma'am. So let the bilateral You see, they have written sensory motor demyelination. Mahesh Mane. Mahesh is my student only. He is there, huh? Uh, he is that uh, Niman's graduate. Is Mahesh the Niman's graduate? I don't know, ma'am. No, no. You are in Maharashtra? Yes, ma'am, Maharashtra. Uh, then he is my student only. Oh. You see. So the bilateral sensory motor demyelination, he has written mm -hmm. now. And amplitude is reduced. So there is a secondary axonal use. So, now, so it's a mixed picture. That is what I told you. In that case, the prognosis is better. You see. Okay. Uh, whereas, if it is a pure axonal, amplitude is reduced, distal conduction is delayed, proximal conduction is good, then you, apparently you'll think proximal conduction is good. But it is a paradox. Patient's recovery will be very poor. Whereas here it is proximal demyelination and distal Features, some features of axonopathy. So it's a myelin mm -hmm. that is lost and secondarily axons are lost. Mm -hmm. So still you can hope for a good outcome for this patient. He's not very old. He's not having many comorbidities. And uh, even though it is rapid, it is subacute only. He did not evolve over 24 hours and he did not have descending pattern. He has no respiratory involvement or autonomic involvement. Uh, so you can investigate. And uh, with the CSF, HIV, and other things, if all those things are all negative, he is going to recover very well, either with plasmapheresis or... Yes, uh, he recovered very well. So that again says it is not a pure axonal neuropathy. So it's a very good presentation. Um, the diagnosis, uh, why I am telling this, I always teach in this systematic pattern. So that, you see, now we know that it is not really a... Pure axonopathy. Axonopathy. So that's a clue. Seen some senior person, you tell him you are going to be on the ventilator and you have to spend some uh, lakhs of rupees and then he may commit suicide. A family might defer treatment. All these things happen in some parts of our country where mm -hmm. economic situations are there. So patients will feel why I will put my family in distress. I have seen this happen. So patients will or uh, do drastic uh, decisions on situations which are reversible. So it's of prognostic relevance. You presented very well and convey my regards to my student, Mahesh. Mahesh is my very pet student also, no? So good, okay. it's a very nice presentation. Thank Wonderful, you. okay. Any doubts you can ask? Any doubts are there? Can we me uh, records to Mahesh? Yes, ma'am. We have together visited ISKCON many times in Bangalore. And with his whole family, we have dined in ISKCON. Okay, thank you. Mama. You repeat about tripod sign. Okay, I can repeat. You see, tripod sign and gower sign. See, when you have a proximal muscle weakness, that is hip extensor is weak, eh? Hip extension primary muscle is the gluteus maximus. Assisting muscle is erector spinae. So when the gluteus maximus is weak, erector spinae will try to do the hip extension. So if the erector spinae has to do hip extension, for example, you want to attend this session, you cannot go to your home like that. We cannot be in two places. So erector spine cannot erect the spine, which is his primary function, if it wants to help the gluteus maximus. So it will stop erecting the spine. So patient will bend. The spine is no more erect. And the uh, erector spine pulls the hip from the iliac crust. Instead of the gluteus maximus, which directly pushes the hip up. So your pelvis down and your hip goes up. Whereas when the erector spine is pulling, it is pulling the iliac crust. It is not elevating the hip. It is pulling the leg. It is pulling the leg from the iliac crust. So the hip will go up and the trunk will bend. Because the erector spine is not erecting and it is pulling the hip. So hip will go up and trunk will bend. 
after this has happened you are very happy that the leg has been pulled up now the patient has to stand the aim is to stand for standing you don't need muscles for standing we need only the bones for walking we need muscle for standing we know we can stand on your bones with locking so for standing now after lifting the hip patient will try to stabilize the ligaments so that femur is stabilized on the tibia and fibula for that he puts one hand on the knee and one hand on the floor and two hands on, two legs on the floor so it is three one leg two le uh, two legs and one hand that is tripod after you are confident that the right knee has been locked then you try to lock the left knee so slowly pull up the left hand and put it on the left knee that climbing is called gowers clear huh? is the question answered clearly any any clarification need to be given us ma'am you have some uh, doubts in youtube ma'am okay so people have asked uh, is there any role of steroids in uh, gillian bar syndrome ma'am you see definitely there is a role personal level i want to tell you see we tell that if it is a immune mediated uh, due to antibody to gm on gangliocyte which are able to demonstrate steroids are useful so but we are not uh, in the position to do gm on gangliocyte antibody to every case but uh, generally even the literature does not support the steroids are useful all of us have found the steroids really help and in major rural hospital steroids are still the mainstay of treatment it does help but for strange reasons uh, one thing we can say relax people say if you start steroid there is a cyclic immune dysregulation so patient will recover and they can relax it is one of the postulate but i have not seen much and i have really found steroid working and the steroids definitely work you, even you can uh, you cannot do gm2 gangliocyte and you cannot deny in a plasma phase is not there in your hospital and patient cannot uh, afford ivig it is not at all harm a uh, good number of patients recover with steroids um another yeah. doubt like uh, how do we differentiate between gillian bar syndrome cardiac anomalies and epilepsy ma so cardiac anomalies and epilepsy is uh, have totally no resemblance to gillian bar syndrome except the stroke adam attacks which happens in heart disease where i just discussed the sudden falling phenomena as you know in stroke adam there is no paralysis they fall down because of the transient asystole during that period of asystole patient is bloodless so he becomes pale like paper no other condition pale like paper people even vasovagal syncope they tell but it is not really that pale real pale paper happens with stroke adam syndrome and soon the rhythm returns and they flush there is no paralysis so you don't have to compare a gillian bar with the stroke adam or heart disease what symptom i analyzed was the sudden falling patient because i have seen stroke adams being treated as epilepsy because you don't get that history somebody has not seen and nobody is able to describe the semiology they are put on anticonvulsant they keep on falling increase the anticonvulsant until one day you see someone who is an eye witness comes and tells madam this man was like paper and then you look at the ecg and you know it's not neurology it is cardiology but gillian barre does not resemble the um, stroke adam or heart attack it is for the falling patient i describe the symptom of the falling patient sudden falling patient any other question yes ma'am uh, another one uh, if paresthesia in this case was told could mm. not it be a large fiber as well as posterior column how to differentiate mm. large mm. fiber mm. neuropathy and posterior column you see when there is a combined involvement of posterior column and large fiber you may have to depend on other spinal cord features but when there is no combined involvement pure posterior column like belmont's posterior column ataxia or tabes dorsalis or pseudo tabes of diabetes 
posterior column involvement does not follow a length dependent pattern it will have a bizarre pattern like one leg it will be up to the knee and another leg it will be up to the hip and two patient will have very bizarre gait because he is having huge posterior column impairment at every level of lifting the leg he does not know where is his leg in the air so you will have very bizarre you will think it is a psychogenic gait he will be very conscious every level he will be lifting in a very bizarre way third feature is reflexes are never lost in posterior column in proprioceptive at the level of the lmn reflexes are lost at the level of the column reflexes are preserved and fourth in the posterior column if you are very lucky you can get a column pattern what is that column pattern you have got a lamination in the posterior column that is called vm vmp that is vibration ventral movement middle and position posterior so you can have dissociated involvement vibration may be involved others may be preserved or others may be involved and vibration may so selectivity within that never happens in the peripheral nor proprioceptive fiber but in the posterior column this can happen then you can have other features like girdle sensation lermit sign all those things so posterior column pr if it is involved sensory loss will be bizarre not length dependent gait will be very bizarre reflexes will be retained and you can have dissociation between vibration movement and position and if you are lucky enough there can be girdle sensation and lermit sign lightning pains all these are seen it is supporting a posterior column whereas peripheral nerve it is symmetrical uniform vibration movement person gets involved a reflexia you don't get lermit sign you don't get girdle sensation so that is the way to differentiate any other question yes ma'am uh, another question is what are the causes of cortical lamina necrosis ma'am so that is uh, not in this case cortical lamina necrosis can be a manifestation of stroke itself uh, or it can be due to meningitis it can be toxic due to alcohol it can be malignant infiltration and it is in cjd crossville jacobs disease so cortical lamina necrosis depending on the context it may be vascular it can be infective it can be inflammatory it can be neoplastic or it can be prion disease as ma'am one last question uh, difference between axonopathy and radiculopathy ma'am you see radical is a proximal shot so supposing it is you have got a radicular pattern of sensory you have got a radicular pattern of motor supposing it is l5 radiculopathy sensory will be in the lateral part of the leg dorsum and goes to the big toe and the muscle supplied is extensor hallucis longus extensor digitorum longus extensor digitorum brevis and gluteus medius and minimus so it will have a radicular pattern of sensory radicular pattern of motor whereas axonopathy what i told distal it's a dying back distal symmetrical mixed with fasciculation fibrillation and uh, electrophysiological supportive data that is the Uh, radiculopathy will have a radicular pattern of motor each root as i told one example each root has got a motor each root has got a sensory each root has got a reflex so it will be a radicular pattern of sensory motor reflex involvement whereas axonopathy is length dependent distal with early fibrillations any other question uh, yes ma'am thank you and we have another question on zoom asking can i in intradural extramedullary lesion cause mm -hmm. hermit sign girdle sensation intradural extramedullary lesion it can but commonly you see first condition where lermit sign is described is syphilitic keratoconditis but it can happen in intrinsic lesions like multiple sclerosis it can happen in compressive lesions like vertebral collapse disc prolapse it can also happen in intra intradural nothing prevents it because an intradural lesions are generally eccentric they are neurofibromas or meningiomas they are one side so they produce root pains more than tract pains but if they are large uh, intra intradural tumors 
and they are sitting on the dorsum of the cord. So that can produce lower midsection. But commonly it is seen in intrinsic lesions picking up the posterior column like demyelinating blocks, arachnoiditis, or compressions like vertebral, intervertebral disc lesions. Intradural can also produce VS. It just means irritation of the posterior column. That's all. Any other question? Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it, it was indeed a very comprehensive class and uh, we need your support and blessings throughout, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and very much. Thank you for the presenter, for the well-prepared presentation. We could learn because of your uh, well-prepared presentation. Thank yes, you, yes. Purva. That girl is very really wonderful, I think. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. I really learned a lot today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everyone.